Sentient beings are limitless in number as space is limitless and the goal is to establish each and every one in the very basic state of mind, the nature of mind, Mahamudra. With this goal in mind, I decide here now to embark on the path of Mahamudra and to pass through all the various stages without any error. This motivation, which is the motivation of Bodhicitta, the awakened heart, is the one that Rinpoche recommends that we should listen with. Now, we have heard that taking onto a path whatever we truly understood which became our own certainty, our own conviction, then has a general outline and a detailed process. Describing the path of familiarization or meditation, what we put into practice, what we truly understood, then is described in the general sense as the verse yesterday showed, and today we are going to have detailed exposition of this. Detailed exposition has three major steps. For one, it's the actual process of familiarization by means of shamatha, the peaceful abiding, and vipassana, the seeing, the, the true, genuine nature. And then secondly, it's to show how along this path experience and realization arises. Thirdly, to show that emptiness and compassion have to be practiced in union and to realize the union of emptiness and compassion. Out of these three major steps, we are in the first one now to get the explanation about shamatha first, then vipassana, and thirdly, the union of those. In the famous verse from Shanti Deva in his treatise Entering the Path of the Bodhisattva, he says, by peaceful abiding, Shamata, perfectly endowed with recognizing the true nature, the Pajana, know that the afflicting emotions, the mental afflictions, are taken out from the root. This indicates that, first of all, what has to be removed here is all that what creates in the suffering the state of mental affliction and confusion, that which removes it actually, the actual removing agent is the <coughs> recognition of nature, which is vipassana. However, to truly have that vipassana happen, we need to have a workable mind. And that which makes our mind workable is the art of peaceful abiding shamatha. So that has to be explained initially. Tatian Tawala, Tara Tobu, Rasashi, 
有没有设计出我们的呢？请问，要不要怎么创造了？现在讲说没有，但不说。The related root verse here says, "Then all the waves of coarse and subtle thoughts pacified right at their own place, subsided at the right, right at their own place, resting within with, uh, within the stream of mind that is unmoving, free from the stains of." The obscurations of dullness and sleepiness may the vast ocean of peaceful abiding be unmoving and stable. That is the thing we should not say. That is, in the new world, the number of people who are coming here is very small. The reason why is that the people who are not here. The word definition of peaceful abiding is then all the mental afflictions that cause suffering, the states of agitation and turmoil, all the mental afflictions perfectly pacified to rest one point of view within what is virtue by nature. To abide within what is virtue. Affliction pacified to abide one point of view in virtue. Then we will use the Nanangunjam, Nanangunjam, the Jubi number. The name Nanto Marich Moti, Kore Jasur Tunjani. Mento Tinzin Lanena, Kashin Tunam never Jus. Nanto Maripa Chamboti, the name Kua Toma never net at the Padola, the name. Now the definition of shamatha as the peaceful abiding or to be more literally would be the pacified abiding goes back to a quotation from one of the tantras. The tantra is called the, direct, the cause for the direct enlightenment of Vairojana Buddha. And here the quotation says, thoughts, the great, mm, the see, thoughts, this great unawareness is are what um, makes us fall into the cycle of suffering of this world. Abiding in stable mind or in samadhi, that is not thinking. Abiding in not thinking samadhi, everything is pure and free like space. Indicates that what causes all our problems and difficulties in this world is mainly the mass of thoughts, the thinking process, that Thoughts that are born out of ignorance, they make us entangled in the, in the confusion and let us fall into the cycle of suffering. And so what has to be achieved to pacify all those thoughts and finally to rest in that type of stable mental concentration, or the stable absorption, samadhi, which is not thinking, not thinking, samadhi, therein everything is pure, as space is pure. Ta te da de nam to se xie yin du nam ba to pa te la yang de ja be nam ba to pa ta ta le nam ba to pa ni se na ta chu mo ban zhe na ta ra de nam to ni de ne ja be nam ba to pa se ya di ji dang yi ji yu la nam ba to pa chu long yu ba chu long yu ba yi ji yu la to pa di yi ji yu la nam ba to pa di de ja pa ta mo ta wa de la re yang yi de la chu ba
Now talking about thoughts, thinking process, there are two types. There are the coarse thoughts and the subtle thoughts. And according to the teaching of the Abhidharma, there are uh, those two with the following difference, that the cause process of thinking is recognizing the presence of objects. So let's say that we have we encounter a form. So the cause thought recognizes saying, oh, there is this form. And what are the subtle thoughts then? The subtle thoughts are what tell about the details of that object. Cause thoughts recognize the mere presence of the object. Subtle thoughts imagine all the small details of the object. Now, in the, the, this has been the explanation according to the Abhidhamma. In the tradition of the oral instructions, the difference is made in the following way. So we have the cause process of thinking, which is what we actually entertain as everyday thoughts and emotions. So what we recognize as, as the passion and emotions in our mind, or the, the cause thought of thinking about something. So this, what, is, what we call the process of thinking, is referred to as the cause thoughts. Subtle thoughts, on the other hand, are a very subtle process that is not part of the everyday experience. It is taking for true the characteristics of the state of peaceful abiding, of samadhi, of absorption, like the bliss, the clarity, and the non thought The taking those states of experience to, for, for true are uh, referred to as subtle thoughts, and those subtle thoughts are only to be recognized <coughs> when we ourselves dwell in such a peaceful abide. <laughs> The first line now gives the instruction how to, meant to handle those thoughts. The whole mass of thoughts, it is said, is not intentionally to be removed. No effort we have to go through to remove, eliminate those thoughts. In fact, those thoughts, as the line says, subside at their own place, like the waves do when they drop back into the surface of the ocean. By merely becoming aware of the thought that appears, by looking straight at its essence, the very thought will subside and disappear at its own place. Tin 
Now, then, it seems that beginners in the process of peaceful abiding have the tendency to get rid of their thoughts, to see the thoughts as an enemy, trying to avoid them, trying to eliminate them. This type of forceful process of tranquilization is not the genuine peaceful abiding. It actually falls under the thought that yesterday was mentioned, it is an intellectually and artificially produced, with intellectual and artificial effort produced a process of familiarization. So that won't work. It's a forceful process and not a natural process. In fact, what has to be done is to understand that thoughts are merely the emanation of mind itself. They are that what appears out of mind and goes back into mind, like the waves that emerge from the surface of the ocean and drop back into the ocean. All the time there have been ocean and they go back into what there are and go back into ocean. So by merely recognizing the thought when it happens to look in, into its essence, the thought will disappear, dissolve into what it is anyway, it, the true genuine nature, the nature of mind. This is the true process of peaceful abiding. Then I bother from such a shame, then I go missing the true one. Then I go in number seven, go in number seven, then you know, number two, I can bother to my shame, go in number seven, then I get on the tower, get on the tower, then I get on the shame, go in number seven, then you are never, none of you never, never. So when this happens, the peaceful abiding of thoughts inside of your own place, like the waves go back into the ocean, the surface of the ocean, in fact, remains unmoved. And here, this is in the second line, addressed by saying, remaining in the continuity, the stream of mind that is unmoved. This type of mind is the all basis. The thoughts come out of this all basis mind and go back into the all many basis, I should know that this all basis is not always a storage consciousness of our habitual ignorant habits. It's the all basis consciousness as the nature of mind from out of which the world of suffering samsara appears as well as beyond suffering nirvana. The thoughts coming out of the nature of mind drop back into the nature of mind. If we can make that happen or watch that happen by receiving thoughts with awareness so that they dissolve back into where they come from. The stream of mind, the, the, the ocean of the base consciousness remains unmoved. <laughs> Gurbatam <laughs> しばらく<音楽><音楽><音楽><音楽> The next line says that while being unmoved, free of the of the stains of obscuration as mental dullness and sleepiness, indicating that there are unfavorable circumstances or hindrances for that process of absorption, which is the unmoved awareness. Unmoved awareness is obstructed by mainly five 
conditions. As the great protector, the gardener has classified, and the five types of hindrances for samadhi are, in the first class, we have agitation, agitated mind, and um, the feeling of remorse, remorse is set up, but those two are separate characteristics. However, they are put together in, in one category here. Secondly, we have the ill-wishing mind, that wants to harm someone. Thirdly, it is um, the dullness, sleepiness, and the sleep. But as we notice in the text of the of the Mahamudra in prayer, we have the dullness and the sleepiness, but the sleep is not mentioned. Here in the categories of the Gardener, then there's the, the dullness and the sleepiness that are the process that are almost falling asleep. But then the sleep is separate when it really happens. So it's different intensities of mental dullness that finally end up in sleep. This is the third category. And fourthly, we have all sorts of longing, it's the longing mind. That we, which contains all the types of passion that we are longing for certain objects of pleasure in this world and not longing for people, taking for true all those seeming objects of our mm, pleasure and happiness. And five, fifthly, then, it is doubt. Those are the five categories of conditions that obstruct the unmoved awareness. <laughs> Now, the first category to talk about that in more detail, for one, contains the agitation which is all the turmoil of thoughts, many thoughts happening, and very agitated, we are excited, excited and agitated. So, the second thing is to feel sorry about something that we did, we thought, we, we didn't do very well, so we are constantly worrying and feeling sorry about what we did. Both situations um, obstruct unmoved awareness to take place. So there are obstacles for peaceful arrive. In the second category, we have the ill wishing mind. Ill wishing mind is related to all those people we can't we we don't like it all. And the thoughts that we entertain towards those people we don't like are, for one, we want to harm them, and secondly, we hope for that something bad happens to them. So these types of thinking process, both, are an obstacle for mind to rest at ease or in happiness. <laughs> Now, in the third category, the obstacle here is all this mental dullness, and in the root verse, as mentioned, the dullness and the sleepiness. In the terms of Nagarjuna, it's that process of um, dullness that and sleep is mentioned. So we can see that he mm, puts the categories, the categories a little bit different. In, in fact, if we put them all in order, it would be like first the state of mental unclarity or dullness, and then it's the sleepiness, and then it's the actual sleep happening. So Nagarjuna just categorized them a little bit different than mentioned in the Rudra. They all are states of unclarity. So in what sense there are obstacles? There are obstacles as they uh, prevent our abiding in clarity. 
The fourth category contains longing, longing for uh, which contains the passion and uh, for objects, the passion for people, and so on. And basically, it's a longing for a sense experience, the sensual experience or sen sense pleasure. And all these types of longing for sense experience or sense pleasure are an obstacle for the workability, the subtleness of our mind. Then it comes to the test on the song. Then the thing is in Julian, the thing is in Julian, and the thing is in the song. You know, thing is in thing is in Julian, and thing is in Julian, and you get test on TV, same thing you want to take a chance. The last category is called doubts. Here related to that process of thought that is uncertain about whether this exercise of peaceful abiding will be successful today or is the fear of that it might not be successful. This type of hesitation and hope and fear process is called doubt and serves as an obstacle in the sense that it prevents our one pointed awareness. 나 대담지 장수 다른 왜 나를 두셨나? 제일이나 누구래? 다른데 목과 당 이내 지만 당 누구래? 제일 한번 시집 당한 그거 당한 누구래? 그래서. If still we want to have a simpler approach, then we can summarize those five categories of obstacles, obstacles for the unmoved awareness into two obstacles, which are the agitation. And the dullness. The dullness is exactly the category number, the category number three, which contains <coughs> the dullness, the sleepiness, and the sleep, and so on. So this we take for one, and all the other four categories are just simply aspects, of different forms of agitation. <laughs> Mm. Not Looking for remedy of those two major obstacles for samadhi, the agitation and the dullness of mind. According to the tradition of Mantrayana, there is a very strong interrelation between our experience of the outer world of senses and the inner world of the nature of our body with the subtle channels and the subtle mm, wind or breathing within and the nature of mind. So all those are closely interrelated. For that reason, when we imagine to be on the top of the high gravel or of the, um, at the top of a mountain and enjoy the wide open landscape and the, the open sky space. This serves as a remedy against the dullness of the mind. On the other hand, to imagine that we are deep down in a hole or some kind of cavity in, in a very narrow room serves as a remedy of the agitated mind. We could as well 
also visit those places directly. You could walk up to the top of a mountain or just sit within a cave or a very small dark room. That's perfectly all right. But also just merely imagining it brings a great benefit against those two types of obstacles. We have to know, however, that those two types of remedies are just of a temporary value, but not the ultimate remedy at all. The ultimate remedy against the state of agitation and dullness of mind are when dullness arises to straight look into its essence, and let it subside just within. Or when agitation is there, to look at the nature of whatever thought pops up and watch the thought subsiding in its own place. This is the ultimate remedy of all sorts of obstacles against the peaceful abiding of awareness. Now, the last line of the verse says, May the ocean of peaceful abiding be unmoved and stable. And this is the state when all the remedies of those different obstacles have shown their effect means the dullness and obscuration of mind has naturally cleared up and all the agitated mind with coarse and subtle thoughts has subsided in its own place thus like the waves <coughs> that drop back into the surface of the ocean the very ocean remains unmoved and peaceful <laughs> The gradual process of entering the peaceful abiding is described according to the forefathers of the Kagyu lineage in four examples. The first state, the beginner in the process of a peaceful abiding, is described as the, the waterfall that shoots down from a cliff. The second step is the wild water stream in a narrow rocky valley in the gorge. That type of water is the second stage. The third one is the water, the great water stream of the river that flows there with the you know, relaxedly, with leisure. And thirdly, fourthly, it is the ocean itself unmoved by waves. The fifth stage then is like the, the shining flame of a battle lamb unmoved by wind. <laughs> so far for Shamata, it's for the Bible. Now, let's try it for five minutes. <laughs>
Ja. 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 Ja.